Thank you, Sister Mary, for that very kind introduction. Uh, I would like to thank all the sisters here for uh, agreeing to be present for this lecture. <laughs> It, it gives me something to brag about when I go wrong. Anyway, what are we talking about? I want to talk about uh, sins of speech. You know, as, as Sister has said, I spent quite a lot of time teaching at Providence College first, the uh, PFIC, and Josephine, and so I've been around the block a couple of times. <laughs> And, uh, but now, this year, I only have one class a week to teach, novices, you know? <laughs> and, uh, so this is great, once a week is fine, but uh, it's really a different experience for me, you know? Uh, no, no exams, no final boards, no opportunity to grill helpless National Dominican sisters. <laughs> on their last stage before uh, getting their degrees. All of that is gone. <laughs> However, I do have the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth and the seventh grade who come for confessions. <laughs> and adults, too. <laughs> and, uh, the adults, I notice a, a very great difference between the adults and the children uh, with, with the matter of confession, because the children are far more articulate than the parents. <laughs> They're more detailed, you know? Um, I mean, you've got a guy who will come in and say, I'm left my father, it's been 30 years since my last confession, and, uh, well, I don't know, I kind of have been impatient <laughs> and, uh, uh, and if, but if I uh, did anything really wrong, which I doubt, <laughs> uh, you give me a solution. Okay. Then the kids come in and start confessing violations of the potential parts of justice. <laughs> <laughs> They've been really well formed by these times. They're okay. <laughs> I want to say the credit goes for the play, or however you want to describe the state of affairs, goes to you. They are amazingly articulate. Uh, but going to the, to the matter of the sins of speech, for example, um, adults will say, I was uh, uncharitable with my speech. Now, uh, that can be you can drive a truck through that. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, I could be a, a lifetime vilification with someone, or it might be a moment's impatience. You know, it, it, you can't, it's hard to tell. But with the kids, as I say, they're able to be more precise about all of this. Thomas, when he talks about sins of speech, is pretty precise himself. Um, let me go through them. Um, I apologize if any of you were there for the talk at the, at the college. I'm going to repeat a little bit of it, not the whole thing, but just a little bit of it tonight. Um, specifically going through the list of sins of speech, Thomas starts with reviling. Nobody at St. Gregory says, I revile someone. <laughs> but they could. Or, and if they, if they said it and they meant it, what they would mean is, I was openly and brazenly contemptuous of someone with the express aim of robbing them of public honors. Well, okay. Uh, you can see what's up there. The, the whole part of that kind of speech is the open contempt you have for the person for whom you speak, to whom you're speaking. You want to rob them of honor. Then there's another kind of sin of speech, which we call Detraction, detraction of character. Sometimes it's mixed up with calumny, right? Detraction being considered when you say something awful about somebody that happens to be true, and calumny when it's not only awful but false. But anyway, uh, detraction, calumny, they get mixed up sometimes. But the point, the essential thing about detraction is that it's a sin of speech that you commit in secret. Uh, one way of talking about it would be a whispering campaign. You know what they, you know their marriage is having trouble, or you know that he's about to be fired for his job, or don't tell anybody I told you this, but, see, 
Those are the magic words. Don't tell anybody I told you this, but. And then the, the dagger comes out. See, it, the point is you murder someone's, uh, not precisely their public honor, but their generally held good name, you know. They're not saying they're a bad mayor, they're saying they're a crummy person, and they're doing it behind your back, stabbing you in the back. You trash it. Then there's tail bearing. Nobody ever says I was guilty of tail bearing. <laughs> but if they were that precise, uh, they would be explained to you that they uh, were spoke ill of someone else, uh, not for a general audience, but for a most precise audience, the friends of the person. What you're trying to do is destroy their make relationships, their friends. Their, the, they want to make their friends think bad of them. And this, St. Thomas says, is the most grievous. That's because we can't really live without our friends. And we can live without a lot of creature comforts, but if we're friendless, we are very poor indeed. You know? Who do you talk to? Who do you have confidence in? Where do you go? It's been to be alone. And to, make, to attack your friendships and to destroy them is to make you truly alone. It's very bad. Uh, then there's derision, uh, mockery, uh, which is, uh, well, this is the most fun to indulge in, as I have to say. Um, uh, what I mean by that is that it, 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 um, it allows you to be witty at someone else's expense. You've you got to laugh out of it. But the point is that, and not, not, not all of not all uh, mockery is is the moral sin, but it can be very light and it can be intended to amuse and it pleases the person about whom you're making the joke. There's no harm done. But there is a way of making jokes about people which does great harm when you make them seem slight, contemptible, not worthy of acknowledgement, you know? Um, where, you, where you're the punchline of somebody's joke and you are uh, thought less of because of it. There was a I don't, any of you ever, you're, this is a young crowd. Um, any old people here? Yeah. <laughs> Anybody see I Love Lucy ever with, with yeah. Okay. Anyway, I Love Lucy with Ethel and Fred and Ricky and Lucy. Lucy, you've got some slanging to do. Well, Ethel, the Vivian Vance who played Ethel Mertz had something that really bothered her, and that was her character. Ethel was supposed to be overweight, and uh, the directions were that she should stay overweight and get more overweight, so that she could look, make Lucy look better by contrast. You know, Lucy wanted to look good, so she made Ethel look fat, and uh, they made a lot of fat jokes during I Love Lucy at Ethel's and Vivian's expense, and. Uh, it's not pleasant, it's not nice, it really does harm. Finally, there's cursing, which is not uh, letting off expletives, but uh, cursing, St. Thomas says, happens in the indicative mood, the subjunctive mood, and the imperative mood. <laughs> Don't you love this precision? I'm waiting for a St. Gertrude's student to come and say, I, I wish someone lived in the subjunctive mood. <laughs> Education has taken deep roots. <laughs> anyway, uh, and the indicative mood uh, is when you go to somebody and say, You are 15 pounds overweight. Uh, and the subjunctive mood it is, I wish I would just die of a heart attack. You know? And the imperative mood is when you make the ill happen. You know? Your words actually bring about the performance. Uh, magic, if, if you believed in magic, you know, that would be like a witch's spell, where you curse someone and that harm really comes. But you can put a hex on somebody without resorting to magic. You just get inside their head, you know. You say bad things about them or to them, and then it starts reverberating in their mind, and then <laughs> soon like, they can't stop thinking about it, and you effectively curse them, you know. You jinx them. Anyway, all of these are sins of speech. Now, 
Uh, Thomas didn't have everything, so we can add some of our own for contemporary sense of speech. Who knows about microaggressions? Yeah, all right. Um, well, this is a, a tricky thing. Uh, it's been described, a, a microaggression has been described as a commonplace and uh, almost a daily verbal slight. Could be unintentional. You might, it, it can be a very subtle thing, and you might uh, not even intend to do it. But nevertheless, through some slight verbal gesture, you communicate negative attitudes towards, and this is a big difference, stigmatize our culturally marginalized groups of people. Examples are ready to hand, the LGBT crowd, uh, the handicapped, the disabled, uh, racial minorities. Uh, these are the kind of people who are the targets of slighting speech, not because of any particular characteristic that they have, but because they're members of a, of a group, you see. I mean, this is what we might call a group benefit program, where, you, where you're included in the, the stigma, uh, not by virtue of your own behavior or actions or personality, but just because you are one of them. Okay. So that's, that's the general field. Now, uh, it can come in very different, uh, uh, microaggression can happen in many different ways. Uh, you might, for example, uh, talk about somebody as a member of a group in a, in a positive way, but it still relies on stereotypes, and so it's harmful. So if you see an Asian student and they get uh, a really high mark on, on a math test, uh, and you say, you people really do well in math. Now that's a compliment on one level, right? But on the other hand, it's a stereotype. It's, it's reducing the individual to the group. It's a compliment, but it's not really a compliment. Um, or you have a, a Jewish student. You, you, you Jewish people are really smart, right? Smart lawyers. Smart business people, aren't you? You can hear the aggression in that, can't you? Yeah. Um, there's also a form of uh, microaggression, which is just plain out invalidating another person's experience of discrimination. This gets tricky because it's hard to, you know, the, the, the microaggressions can be so subtle that you don't notice them. And then it comes easily, uh, you, you can cross the border easily into uh, oversensitivity or seeing insults or slides where the word in it was not intended. But, and this is where you're kind of guilty before you're, before you're even charged. Uh, it's where you invalidate somebody else's experience. I, I was discriminated against last week at the board meeting. Did you see that blatant example of racism? And then you know, the other people who were there say, I'm sorry, it just looked like a normal business meeting to me. And I didn't see that. And then it, but it, it's tricky because if you say that, I didn't see the discrimination there, then According to this way of looking at it, you're invalidating an experience. See, but that's the problem. I mean, your, your experience is taken to be self-evidently true. If you say it, then it's true. If you were offended, then you were really and truly offended. There's no appeal against that. There's no way of arguing. There's no way to defend yourself. Anyway, you can listen though, because perhaps it's true. You have to go back and, and, and revisit the experience. There's also a, a way of doing this, which is pathologizing cultural differences, where you make remarks about somebody based on their style or their ethnicity, their, their, their sense of fashion, the way they wear their hair, you know, things like that. Or uh, pathologizing another cultural difference would be uh, cultural responses uh, or cultural uh, norms of behavior. Asian students, for example, I'm told, are generally more quiet in the classroom. They, they've been brought up to have great respect for their teachers and so they let the teachers speak. Uh, but that can be, uh, again, overlooking the individual in the section group. Maybe the student just is quiet or afraid or or there may be other explanations, you see. 
Then there's finally there's confusing the differences between uh, groups that to an outsider look similar, but which in fact are different. We had a guy, Josephine, uh, who was a wonderful fellow, we had a lot of fun. Uh, he was a Cuban guy, and if you ever really wanted to upset him, you would call him a Hispanic. See, you don't make that mistake. You know, the, 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 the Hispanics are not a group. Uh, are not a, there, there are many, many, many subgroups, and within those groups, there are groups. So, making mistakes in all these things can be all in the realm of microaggression. Now, I'm going to say two things about this. Uh, Thomas's way of talking about sins of speech is really, are, they are instances of what he would call commutative injustice. That is to say, they are instances of an involuntary exchange between individuals. In this case, it's a verbal exchange. But it's Bob and Jack, you know, two single people who are involved in this altercation. And it's involuntary. Nobody likes to be reviled, detracted, being the victim of tail bearing derision or cursing. Nobody really looks forward to that. So it's negative, and it's involuntary, but it's between individuals. Now, uh, with the microaggressions, I think we're in a different category of justice. With microaggressions, we're dealing not with uh, commutative injustice, but with distributive justice. And also with um, a, a particular form of uh, commutative justice that is juridical. Let me, let me see, we'll tell you what I mean by that. Um, see, the difference between Distributive justice and commutative justice is that commutative justice is between individuals. And because they're individuals, they're equal individuals, and they're on a level playing field. There's a certain equality there of status. And that's why when there's inequality of status, there's also an inequality of justice. Justice is only a, uh, partly real. So if you're a parent and you have children, the child can't say, oh, there are two of us, Bobby and Susie, and, uh, and there's only one of you, and we, we both, we go to Disneyland. <laughs> we outvoted you, Mom and Dad. No, this is not a democracy, and you're not my equal. You know? You're not, you're my child. Uh, we're, we aren't equal, and so we're, we don't get equal treatment. Well, that's what's, uh, with, with the government, it's the same way. Uh, but I was a kid. At first, actually, this is the first day of the first grade that my mother told me about this is what I behaved like. <laughs> uh, my older sister is in tears because she has to be there for the 815 mass and she's late, but she's she's sure sister is going to cannibalize her at that rate. <laughs> And uh, she goes, hey, 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 my mother's going to be, sister's going to be so mad at me. And, okay, so my mom's dealing with her. No, come on, Jane, you get you, you, you do this. Come on, you're going to be all right. Sister's not going to eat you. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm on the, the stairways going up to the second floor. And I'm, I haven't learned to read, but I'm reading the newspaper upside down. <laughs> I haven't gotten dressed. Oh, I'm in my pajamas. My mother says, what are you doing here? I told you to get dressed. And I look out under the newspaper and said with a kind of calm, sovereign majesty, you tell them I can't make it today. <laughs> But I thought, 
I say, I, I didn't get to say I'm not going to school, right? Uh, distributive justice, you don't get to say to the government, I'm not going to pay my taxes this year. Or I'm not going to, you know, go by by the, the uh, speed limit. So, you know what I mean? We, we don't have the status of equals with the government. Now, the government, or, that, or whoever has final authority, is in charge of the common good. So they distribute one, and it's not arithmetical equality, that it's geometrical equality, it's equality of proportion. They award benefits uh, to people, not on the basis of everyone gets the same, but on the basis of uh, the previous services of the common good. Now, who gets to make those decisions? Well, you better have you, know, you better have a good and just government because uh, by definition, there's no appeal to a higher authority. People who are in charge of distributed justice, whether it's the Communist Party in China, or the Congress, or uh, the King, or whoever, or the aristocracy, whoever has been effective charge, they're the final court of appeal. And you better hope they're just, because if they're not, there's the only recourse of submission on one and a revolution on the other. But what I, my, my, the, my thesis really is this, that in the war over microaggressions, and it is a war, um, what's really be, being contested is who gets to control the naming of the common good. It's really, that because people who claim that, that you have microaggressed against them are not claiming simply that you offended me. They are claiming that as a member of a group, you have violated my share in the common good. And that's a different thing to say, it seems to me. It's a, it's a, a subtler thing to say, but I think it's a more serious thing to say. We can get over hurt feelings, but if it's not simply us, but our membership in a group, and my group has been disrespected in me, and I am entitled to justice, then I get to redistribute the common good. I'm claiming that right. I'm claiming that authority. By right. And what does that tell us? Well, in, in our own society, that tells us that uh, who the people are who are in charge of the common good is not at all clear. But I think that the war over microaggressions and cancel culture really is an acknowledgement that on a very profound level, our society is split, divided, that there is no moral, uncontested center of authority. People are vying for status, sometimes as victims, uh, that kind of status, which gives them the right to demand control over who gets what. It's a war, uh, I think it's, it, uh, because there's no, it's not recognized generally, and certainly the solution to it is not agreed, I think that we're actually, as a society, in uh, deep trouble. I do. All right. Um, notice how, uh, I've talked about this in terms of the shares of the common good. You can look at it also as a, a usurpation of juridical or criminal justice. Look at what happens when you have a cancel culture. Somebody uh, is, has offended someone, and then other people get a campaign on the internet to try to drive them out of business. Okay, there was a, a, a this can happen in many different ways. Has happened in many ways. Uh, so. What, what then? Well, then the people who are doing the call out or the canceling have assumed the role of judge. They're determining what is just. They are determining the sentence. We shall deprive them of business. We shall also, they also play the role of advocate or lawyer. They, uh, social activists will come and make a protest and will actually try to uh, cancel business, get it shut down, deprive the people of employment. Basically, it's a form of ostracism. Ostracism is a serious penalty to undergo in an interconnected society. And so that, uh, when you claim the authority or the right to do that, uh, you are basically usurping an unofficial juridical system. Again, it's a matter of a shadow government. Or not, not literally a government, not literally an institutional government, 
but a contested sphere of moral authority where people are unofficially doing what they think the official government ought to do. It's a kind of mob justice. Now, to say it's a kind of mob justice doesn't mean that people aren't really offended, there aren't really offenses, that there aren't injustices done, and that they ought to be addressed in some way. I don't know how to solve this problem. I just am pretty sure it exists. I want to move on, though, to talk about something else now. <laughs> My vacation last summer. <laughs> Uh, I want to talk about uh, this, the, this problem of sense of speech, not from the perspective of distributive justice or, or a pseudo-juridical system, but from the perspective of charity. Uh, what, what different angle do we get when we look at this from the perspective of charity? Well, what we come up with is uh, an alternative way of speaking that Father Sidney Pinker, as the film uh, mention was made, and do acknowledge the author. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in all his years as a professor at Freeport, he never once got a. Oh. <laughs> he would have loved it. <laughs> anyway, I want to talk a bit about. A kind of moral discourse that can uh, heal some of these defects in our, in our way of speaking with each other. Um, what is it? He says that what we really need in moral thinking is a return of paradisus or paraclesis. For our purposes, the terms are the same. Uh, kind of an elaborate definition is a, a heuristic modern term used to describe a text for communication in which a person of authority, we call him A, addresses another party, we call him B, who shares A's basic convictions about the nature of reality and in order to influence B's behavior in the practical issues of everyday life, um, in order to strengthen B's commitment to the shared ideological convictions, where this may incorporate traditional ethical material, and it may use some of these literary devices, brevity of style, household code, and typical statements, not A, but B, and an offering of examples to be imitated. All right, this didn't work. Let's try a shorter, more concise one. <laughs> this is called the Oslo definition. Um, and it says that paradise is, is a concise, benevolent injunction that reminds of moral practices to be pursued or avoided, expresses or implies a shared worldview, and does not anticipate the screen. And it's clear that this sort of genre exists in the scriptures. In fact, Pinker said it was the major mode of moral teaching in the New Testament. But Pinker considered examples of paraclesis as Romans 12, 15, where the Christian life is presented as a liturgy, spiritual worship we give to God by offering him our bodies and our persons within the body of Christ. Uh, we have become Christ's members through baptism and his charity animates us. Galatians 5. Um, let me see, yeah, here we go, Galatians 5. It's a good example. Um, for you were called the freedom, brothers, but do not use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Rather, serve one another through love. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you go on biting and tearing each other, beware that you are not consumed by one another. I say that live by the Spirit, and you will certainly not gratify the desire of the flesh. For the flesh has desires against the spirit, and the spirit has desires against the flesh. These are opposed to each other, so that you may not do what you want. But you are guided by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious, immorality, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, hatreds, rivalry, jealousy, outbursts of fury, acts of selfishness, dissensions, factions. Sound familiar? Yeah. 
uh, cages of envy, drinking bouts, orgies, and the like, or that those who do such things will not enter the kingdom of God. In contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, then let us also follow the Spirit. Okay. Let us not be conceited, provoking one another, or envious of one another. All right, so that's a fair example of what Peter's talks about as paraclesis and as the uh, central mode of moral teaching in the New Testament. All of these modes of teaching presuppose that the happy, the goal of the moral life is happiness with God, that God has come to us in his kingdom and it is attainable to us. Happiness with God is the goal of our striving. It uh, presumes that virtue is the path to that happiness, theological virtues and moral virtues. Uh, and the mode of expression here is exhortation which presupposes and relies on the friendship between the speaker and the people who listen to it. The, the underlying hum, the underlying beat of this mode of moral discourse is, we are family. <laughs> that's, what, that's the mode of analysis. Um, uh, we are together, we are one, uh, and we all agree about the kingdom of God, and so we can be motivated by our common vision to live appropriately to that vision, all right? Now, how this works at, in a practical way, um, it operates uh, by paraclesis, is, first of all, remember the word of God. That means, like any word of God, it affects what it signifies. It's like Saturn, in a way, it affects what it signifies. God says, and it is. God said, let there be light, and there is light. Well, the same kind of thing is said to be operative here. These kinds of passages have a healing power to them to reorder your disposition. So, again, specifically, not specifically for justice, but charity, which is a higher virtue. Paraclesis is rooted in the special form of knowing that is faith. And faith itself is a form of noetic healing, the need for which implies that something has gone askew in human rationality. It's possible to treat this question from the perspective of the necessary limitation of any creature, however excellent, and to conclude that even in an unfallen world, human nature would require the elevation of grace, and the human mind would require the gift of faith before a personal union with God could be secured. But in the fallen world, we have all the more need to hope for in plain and faith and no wedding grace, which is at one and the same time elevating and healing. Now, the no wedding grace offered by the gospel is, of course, the wisdom of the cross, offered in opposition to the wisdom of this world. Pinkers considers these contrasting wisdoms in an article entitled Aquinas' Pursuit of Beatitude. In this article, he considers the apostolic paraclesis offered by St. Paul in the first letter of the Corinthians. The standards of worldly wisdom are put to flight by the wisdom of the cross. In fact, St. Thomas explains the preaching of the cross, the object of faith, contains truths that seem impossible to the eyes of human wisdom. For example, that God should die, that the all-powerful one should be subjected to human violence. According to the letter to the Romans, the masters of this age have been able to rise to certain knowledge of the Creator by the consideration of his works, but since human wisdom was pleased to rest in the corruption of lust and idolatry, God had to reform this wisdom, teaching through the folly of the cross, the wisdom that could be apparent only to faith. Okay, now paracletic speech is uh, 
actually evangelically original. That is, it, see, the argument here is that there are forms of, you know, do good, avoid evil, uh, uh, be fair, be just, be honorable, that kind of discourse that we call paraclesis is really a matter of formal morality rather than uh, material, a cubic longer formal norm rather than a material norm. Formal norm being be good, be chaste. It's, it's about the person. It's a norm that directly applies to a person as such. Whereas material norm describes prescribed or uh, forbidden behavior. So be just is a formal norm that applies to a person. Pay your taxes by April 15th is the material norm. Now, the formal norms admit of no exception. The material norms, the more specific you are, the more you can find an exception. Now, some people find paraclytic discourse basically useless because uh, to be just doesn't help to, to obey or try to obey the commandment. Be just doesn't have any content unless you know what justice is already. That's what you need. You need to be fair. I've got a problem. I've got a dilemma. I say to you solemnly and authoritatively, I know the answer to your problem. Be fair. <laughs> well, if you've got a problem, be fair doesn't help you much. If that's what you're trying to figure out, how to be fair. But, um, so you have to do other work for material norms. And that's where we're contested in this world because, you know, what the basis for morality is, is the subject of the course. I've offered more times than I can care to recall. <laughs> anyway, um, but it, it is contested ground. But you see, the paracletic thing, be, you know, be renewed in the Lord, has a power uh, which is not derived from the surrounding culture, and it's basically derived norms of, of moral truth. It's not derived from the culture, it's derived from the Paschal mystery. There's God did something in Christ which changed things. And when you appeal to that, when you root yourself in that, you find that your mind, as St. Paul advises in Ephesians, is subject to renewal. Okay. Um, now, let's go to the letter to the Corinthians again. Um, he talks about the conflict between uh, the wisdom of this world and the wisdom of the cross. Uh, but Paul, I mean, we, there are people who have, have looked at that section of the letter to the Corinthians and thought that what Paul was confronting with the uh, appeal to Apollos, an incipient form of Russian or the Greek orthodoxy, and with the appeal of Paul, basically is an appeal, early appeal to Proto-Lutheranism. And Peter, of course, is the big guy. I, so I belong to Peter, I belong to St. Paul's really, is a Proto-Roman Catholic. In other words, uh, some people treat these parties as having incipient theological divisions. That, I don't think that's the best reading. Really, it's a matter not so much of, of theological nuance between the different apostles, it's a matter of social competition. It's a matter of who came to your cocktail party last week. <laughs> um, from that perspective, the first letter to the Corinthians, uh, uh, the basis for the divisions in the Corinthians seems to have been not divergent doctrinal positions, but differing and equally false criteria used to justify ecclesial and social prominence. I belong to Apollos, I belong to Cephas, I belong to Paul, I belong to Christ. These are not slogans signaling divergent interpretations of the gospel. They are slogans signaling the presence of self-inflated camps, each one striving for status each one striving for worth, each one striving for public acknowledgement, each one striving for ecclesial approbation, each one a victim of microaggressions. The divisions appear to have been between competing members of diverse social strata in the Corinthian church 
and therefore between factions all equally thinking according to the flesh. The need for acknowledgement and status creates idols which are needy and compulsive and which require full adherence in order to grant validation to one's status, worth, and position. In this context, Paul's mode of preaching and the tone he establishes fit the substance of his message exactly. Paul refuses to locate himself in a war over social geography. Instead, he writes, when I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words of wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I came to you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. My speech and proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with the demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith might rest not on human weakness, but on the power of God. See, there's a connection between noetic disability and sin. In Romans, the first chapter, the failure to know the one God through the signs of himself that he left in his creation is not due to a defective Aristotelian philosophy. It's, it's uh, not a matter of intellectual failure. It's a question of rebellion. Paul is saying that the world obviously proclaims God, and if you don't see it, it's because you're rebelling against it. It's the effect and not the cause of your rebellion. It's a self blinding Okay. Uh, one of the symptoms of this uh, is an incapacity for and an ever-increasing aversion to the truth about God and the truth about the order of creation which reflects God's wisdom. There's a link between noetic disability and sin. And this sin indicates that sinners do not, so, do not see the world in its true light. This can take many forms and ended in the divisions of the church in Corinth. Envious misperceptions concerning one's true status and place in the world. We can see this in the Desert Fathers. The same problem worked itself out in the Desert Fathers. Mark McIntosh writes, these writers have taken, to get taken together suggest what it might mean to share in the mind of Christ, to heal and awaken human rationality from grasping and jealous habits of mind by flooding the whole person with the light of the limitless divine abundance that is in fact the very ground of the mind's activity. Persons whose entire existence have become attuned to this abundance no longer understand anything according to the flesh, as Paul puts it. That is, they no longer understand reality in terms of a fundamental lack, compelling all the anxious self-seeking. They are instead awake to the endless mercy of God giving life. Just by way of setting the scene, consider the following observation from the vagaries. Quote, spiritual fat is the obtuseness with which evil cloaks the intelligence. Behind this conviction, I believe, lies the thought that reality is in fact inaccessible to minds that have fallen into certain debilitating convictions. To draw an initial implication, this might mean that faith would have an ascetical function, setting the reason free from ugly and yet hypnotically self-gratifying illusions about others. Just the kind of illusions about others that give rise to all the sins of speech that St. Thomas described or the microaggressions that we all experience today. I've been going on too long, so I'll, I'll wrap this up. Um, the, the solution to this, um, is, as I say, the, the problem of a verbal assault and microaggressions and calumny and all the rest of it, is to heal the mind. It's not a matter of reforming habits of speech, it's a matter of reforming the mind that gives rise to the speech. 
The mind that gives rise to this kind of speech is an anxious mind. It is a debilitated mind. It is a mind that is not sure that it is valuable or that it, that, 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 that it's safe, you know. And minds who are governed by envy and these kinds of sins of speech are really afraid of the loss of that little status they have. And that means they have a metaphysics of scarcity. They have the, the, they do not know that there is an abundance of wealth and life available to them. See, Christ, when he came, uh, underwent a kenosis. He died, not just a physically painful death, more specifically, he died a shameful death. You know? When the scriptures talk about somebody being put to shame, they're not talking about being socially embarrassed by an indiscreet cough or a poor fashion choice. <laughs> uh, they're talking about someone to whom and about whom God has said, this is not my child. This is a fraud. When Christ was put on the cross and endured the shame, was the letter that Hebrews says, uh, Christ endured people saying about him that he is not God's son, God has rejected him. That's what the cross would have meant. But in um, Deuteronomy it says, Cursed be he who hangs on the tree. Cursed God, cursed him. At least that's what the Pharisees thought. That the death on the cross was not simply physically agonizing, but the final and irrefutable proof that this man was a fraud. Now, he was willing to endure that, and he did endure that. He was put to shame, but that so far as the world can put someone to shame, but he triumphed over it, see. His act of obedience was answered by the Father in raising him from the dead, and now he lives beyond the reach of human, human desire, and is the source of every honor. From that act of selfless generosity and love, flows of abundant grace which is capable of healing our jealous and divided minds. Which is what we need. Um, when you get into microaggressions and wars over social geography, it's almost impossible to, to um, I mean, you can decide more or less what's fair and what's unfair, and you work on this, and you have, uh, well, that, that's the whole of the lecture of practical solution in the civil sphere to this. I don't have it. Uh, but on a theological level, the answer is, of course, conversion. On a theological answer level, the answer is the church uh, living together in the charity of Christ, where we speak to one another, not in derisive, derisive ways or in calumniating ways, but with hymns and songs and spiritual songs. And, encouragement and endless confidence that the charity of God can remake even your stubborn neighbor of somebody glorious. You know? uh, that's what you have to have, and that's what you have to live in the church. We have to live it together. This will not solve our legal or social problems, but it will provide an oasis, a place where people in responding to God's revelation can grow in the knowledge that they don't need to be afraid of microaggressions against them, and they can forgive them, and they can be free of the need to answer in kind. Thank you very much.